great speaker, but uh, got a lot of people asking me questions about you know how I join wood. So I figure I'm just going to leave it open. If you guys got questions, just spit them out. A little background on myself. Uh, been carving out for 13 years. Uh, prior to carving, I was a, a carpenter and finished work. Uh, I always like woodworking, but uh, I was also an adventure guy. Play water rafting, ice climbing. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, basically, uh, I got into carving. I was I was hurt out in the mountains, had an injury, and it led me to carving. And it's probably the best thing that's ever happened. Uh, otherwise, I'd probably be washed up on some some glacier somewhere out in British Columbia. But now I'm here, and uh, you know, I, the more I talk to people and how people get interested in carving, it's amazing the stories that come about and who you meet. Uh, who's who's inspiring? My inspiration. I I was just driving down a road up in Vermont and I saw a uh, carving on the side of the road. Basically, I looked at the carving and I said I could probably do that. And uh, I'm glad I tried. And it's taken me in a lot of different places and met people from all over the world. So it's a it's really a great community that we have here, and I, I really appreciate everybody coming out. Um, who here is the uh, first time being here at the rendezvous? Great, great. It's kind of overwhelming, uh, but uh, it, it's it's an amazing thing. I, I, I came here the, the second rendezvous they ever had in 2001. Uh, I remember I just pulling up my little trailer and looking around and saying, "Oh, nice," you know, and just this. It was overwhelming, but uh, you, you join this family, and it's a, it's a family that you'll you'll have forever. And, uh, we're all out here to share and enjoy. And the thing is, don't be intimidated. Uh, asking questions, soaking up everything you can get. It's there's so much to see and so much to do. If you could, if you could concentrate on like just one thing that you pick up, you know, each year you come back. I've been coming back. I uh, I've been coming back. This is my ninth rendezvous, and every year I, I go around and I look around and I find something new something that I've never seen before, and that's the beauty of it. I mean, we all collaboratively have so much to share. Uh, hopefully, what I talk about here will help people, uh, you know, see a little bit different. Our resources are getting smaller, and our ideas are getting bigger. So, uh, yeah, let's join some wood together and, you know, make these, make these pieces bigger than, than life size. Uh, any questions? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Let's talk about... How do you join uh, two pieces of wood together? Yeah. <laughs> well, all right, let's see. I don't really have a game plan here, so I'm just going to... What I'll do is, uh, probably a lot of you have seen that the horse that I created. Was, uh, I, I carved that out in Gig Harbor, Washington. It was out of one, one tree that was what, 40 feet tall, and I cut it up in four sections. Okay? I basically didn't have a game plan. But by doing this, it took me about six weeks to figure out, the help of Ken Pack and Ken Tynan, uh, and collaboratively we put this thing together, and it really uh, it kind of blew us all away of like, holy cow, we could actually do this. And by, by this stepping stone and putting this thing together, it just opened the world for any kind of carving we ever want to do. We don't have to do those real skinny, twisted bears anymore. We could add two pieces and make that life-size bear that we've always wanted to carve. Um, so, basically, I think it'd be easiest on myself. I'll just kind of go through it where where the process started. And obviously, we had a we had a tree, and well, let me uh, backtrack a little. When I was out uh, visiting Ken Patrick last year after this uh, after the rendezvous, um, one of his clients had me uh, carve a horse patch for him. And she loved the horse bench, and then after I did that, she asked me if I could do, uh, she showed me a picture of the Da Vinci horse, and she said, would you ever be interested in trying to do this? I said, oh, heck yeah, I would love to try it, uh, but I, I can't guarantee anything. And so she, uh, she said, well, if you could put it together, you know, send me some pictures, I'd be interested. Told her when I go out to Washington, there's some bigger wood out there I could, you know, see what I could do. Didn't really have any kind of game plan, had no idea what I was getting into. But we had a log that was about 30 inches in diameter, and I carved the front end of the horse. I can't even draw right now. But. Okay, so 
I have the shoulder in here, something like that, right? Um, uh, and I got this section. Actually, I had a, this, the, the Da Vinci horse, the head was more out. I had to really strike it down to fit it into this log here, okay? So I had this, <coughs> again, don't go off the pictures, this is this. So I had this one log, and I was just trying to carve uh, this front, just the front half of the horse. It was just going to be, I have a bear down there, um, and I started doing these a couple of years ago, just taking a big log and just doing the front end of, of the carving, doing the head, you know, putting the paw down. I like big grizzly heads, but again, I don't have these huge logs to do the full bear. So I just wanted to capture that one element, you know, that, that, that picture that you see all the time that everybody wants to capture. And it, it's usually in the face. You know, you look at a carving, you look at the face. You're not really looking at the butt or you're not looking at the back end of it. So I started doing a lot of carvings where I'm just capturing uh, that, that emotion and that element. But just using a small log, you can capture a lot just right in the front. So I started, I started this, and I carved this, this whole front end. Not, I didn't have a plan to put a whole horse together. I just, this was a practice to get that position of the head, the arm. Um, I really wanted to put the shoulders and the muscles. So I was sitting there, and after two days, I had this thing roughed out, and it just kind of, it, it's amazing how things happen if you don't really think about it and you just let things happen. Things, things will happen in this. Um, I was sitting at my trailer and. I was looking, looking back at this horse, and it just happened to be, well, in the distance, there was the other log sitting right here. Actually, it was a little shorter. It was just sitting maybe like five feet away, but it was actually in, it was farther away, but the distance. And I started looking at it, and I just started going, oh, there's, well, there's the front end of the horse, you know, and then there's the back end of the horse, whatever something like that, right? So the next day I came out and I took that and I, I carved that back end, just like that. And uh, it was, and then we had two, then I had to figure out, okay, how am I gonna get this belly in here? So I, I had one log that was able to fit that in, another log able to fit that in. And I, I was looking at the wood grain. The wood grain on that western red cedar was just beautiful. Pretty much any wood we work with, when you really start looking at grain, uh, it really offers, you know, ever, ever, ever say, oh, how'd you get the grain to do that? Well, I didn't get the grain to do that. It just, the wood is there. And, uh, the way you sand and contour, these grains pop out. But looking at it, I had vertical grain here and vertical grain here. My original idea was to put a horizontal log in here. And I started looking at it saying, well, this is vertical grain, horizontal grain. We have a, a you know, it, it just wouldn't flow. So I had one more log that was about the similar size, okay? This, the center piece here, I knew I needed about 28 inches wide for the width, but I needed 30, 36 inches approximate. It was about 40 inches, I say, um, wide, or in lengthwise. So how are we going to do that? Uh, I had one log to work with that was about this size. So what I did was I took, let's see, how do I draw this? If you're looking over the top of the log, yeah, yeah, okay, here's the log. Okay. And what I did was I took, I, this log was about 30 inches wide, or in diameter. So I took 18 inches, cut a slab, cut a slab, actually, you look at it, you cut it like this. Okay, this is looking over the top of the log. This was this was close to 28 inches, and this I, I stretched it out. So this I got about 20 inches here, right? So I took that log and I slabbed it down like that. So I had this big got a rectangle, and then I cut it in half. Now I took this block here. And I put the next block here, so it actually get a little confused here. But, um, are you are you guys following me? Yeah, I'm 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 what I'm saying? So I took, I took that one log. It was it was this tall. Slapped it down, cut it in half. Then I took. So this is the end grain here, um, like 
that and like that. I put those two blocks together to be in the end grain so this this actually went like this and like that. Does that make sense? And then I just started cutting and, and piecing the, the pieces together to make up so I had 30, 36 this way, 38, uh, 28 this way. What that did was it really matched up the grains pretty nice. It made a bookmark. I had no idea how to do that. It was all just on a whim. When I sanded it down, I realized, wow, that looks really good. The cool thing about it is this outer layer on each side is the sapwood, and it contours in. So when I, when I butted these two together, actually I, I sanded off a little bit more than I wanted to, but on the next one, I'll know that that outer end grain, and it really creates this beautiful bookmark image. So this is just, it's a simple concept to do, but it's a very, I mean, it's a, in, in theory, it's a simple concept, but to actually put these massive pieces together wasn't so simple. So, going back to, uh, going back to my woodworking skills, I know, um, and I learned this from, this is a very kind of important lesson I learned in, in Crown Bowl. Uh, if, I don't know who here has ever done any carpentry or finish work. I mean, you, you look at, you know, I've always watched Norm Abram and his joints, you know, he's just like, oh, just add a little, and it fits perfect, right? I mean, who here has ever been able to get something that fits perfect? It's hard, you know, especially with a chainsaw and especially with a big, rough log. But one thing I always learned is in crown molding, uh, up in the corners, you got all these compound miters. And I, I learned from a guy, he taught me once, and I was trying to get these things, and no matter how precise you cut them, you always got this little bit of gap here and there, nothing ever fits. And he says, well, just take away the wood from behind it. So your edges are paper thin. And what that does is then when you put those two joints together, that wood is so thin you could actually squeeze them together and that joint will, will disappear. Um, a little bit hard to explain, but it'll, I think I think you'll get it once I once I explain it. So I had these big blocks. I had this horse. <coughs> I had the front and the back end. Okay. Um, so I, I'm I'm kind of just shooting from the hip here. I have no real game plan. And what I realize is, in the basic, in order to get things straight and even, you need a straight, and flat, and true surface to work on. So I went to Home Depot and built myself a box to work on. I figure that's my level point. Everything off that I could I could use. So I built the box. I put the logs on the box. Okay. All right. It's a terrible looking box, but who cares? Okay. So we got this horse. We got this this block up here. We got this block up here. Picture this: the front and the back. Um, I had to get these two blocks in. We had no machinery, no no equipment, but we did have Ken Tyner. <laughs> we all know Ken Tyner. He's he can move pretty much anything. And if if you haven't heard the story, he was a mover out in Tucson. He tells that story quite often. But basically, we took these two blocks. We backed up our tailgate. I needed to I needed to keep cutting these blocks to get them closer and closer to join it, uh, to get them to the straight lines. So what I did was I I built a. Uh, Underneath, I built a beam that went across like this. Okay, and now this this piece, this piece, and these pieces I sit on. These all can move back and forth, and I have a again, I have a, 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 a stable place to put them. So I'd set a block like this, set a block like this, and then as you start cutting, let me do that little bit. I'm just going to keep them straight lines for now because it'll be easy to see. Okay, so you got these you got these four blocks you want to put together. Okay? Get them as, as as clean as you can, you run your chainsaw through. Run your chainsaw through, run your chainsaw through. Now you got you got lines that are pretty close, but they're still just cut with a chainsaw. So then I would squeeze the whole thing together. I'd go back and I kept trying to cut these. I started out that, that horse was probably like I think about four or five inches longer than I first started. What I was running into is when you take two big blocks, you know, two big surfaces of wood, you press them again, and you cut right down the middle, right? In theory, it'll make a bookmark image. And again, like if anyone with wood joinery, you do that with a skill saw, 
and you can really make two pieces fit really close together. The chainsaw is a little different, and you have such a wide surface. And I don't care how good you sharpen or anything, when you cut right through, you know, you get this little bit of chatter. And that little bit of chatter will not create a, a smooth surface. So I'm like, we went around, I kept going around and around and trying to get these, these pieces. But no matter what I did, I would have gaps, and I just couldn't figure it out. So I, I kind of let it go. I roughed everything in. I, 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 I got the piece. Um, but then I went back to that, that same concept of how do you get that, that wood to really match up. So I came up with this, I came up with this theory. This, if I have to take as much wood out of these pieces as possible. So if you're looking down the, uh, let's see, let's see, uh, how would this? I had it in my head earlier, but I, I kind of forgot. Okay, so you got a surface here, right? This is looking at, at the wood here. If I want the blocks to touch, what I did was I hollowed the whole piece out. Again, I'm just using a square just to make it. I hollowed the whole piece out in the center. Okay? Now, as I run my chainsaw through this way, I'm only have to cut this much wood instead of trying to get my bar all the way through there. So all I had to do is take the tip of my bar and run it through. This all being gone, there's no wood on either side to touch. So you only have to join this much wood together. And by doing that, by cutting all the way around, I was able to really control it, get it down to a pretty close, close joint. Then what I realized is being, this being hollow, taking my chainsaw, okay, I got it pretty close, but now, then I took a, uh, uh, just a regular handsaw, like a Japanese pull cut with a fine curve, and I just went around like that, and it took me a long time, and if you guys were out there yesterday, I did the same thing uh, on the piece I'm working on now, and I was able to just go around, and eventually, you know, you, you still have that, and just keep going around and keep sucking those two pieces together, and eventually, that joint will become pretty, pretty, uh, pretty tight. Still, even with all that, you had some gaps. So, um, what I've learned now is this is my outer edge. So now I get this, I get this whole piece sanded down to pretty much finished stage. So I know I don't have to go any more like width. I don't have to lose any more wood. So what I did is I took the piece apart and I actually tapered on the inside just with my angle grinder. I actually, uh, trying to think of the perspective so it's a an idea. Uh, yeah, I actually just sanded from the inside, leaving about an eighth of an inch on the outside, and just sanded back, just just a whisker. And what that did is that beveled it, so that whole horse, the outer edges are just... About what angle do you say? Back cut, that's what you it, call that. Yeah, back, back cut. cut. Yeah, it, I don't know if I'm explaining it right, but basically, Instead of having this huge block and a huge block touching like this, the only things that are really touch the angle is not severe. It's it's tiny. It's very it's just it's just so you don't have two flat surfaces touching, you have two points. And then as you squeeze the piece together, that wood will just mesh right in, kinda like that that uh that prom model I was talking about. You just the outer edge is, is the only part of the wood that's actually touching. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So that's a big key in wood joinery. Uh, you don't want to back up too much. You want to leave wood behind it. But if you have a little bit more than a paper's thickness that's not touching, what happens is that wood you can squeeze together uh, because that, that fiber in that wood with enough clamps and enough big straps, you can actually squeeze this piece together. With a little bit of Gorilla Glue that bleeds out, you'll never see the seam. Sounds easy, but... Uh, it, it does take a little bit of time and a little bit of patience. But what I, I ran into, I ran into another problem, is that every time I kept cutting all the way around, the wood would, you know, in some areas, the, the wood would squeeze together, and, and then the other, as, as I'm cutting, like the top would start pinching, you know, and then, and then this gap here is getting wider. So, like, you, you're fighting it. So what I did was I made, I made jigs, um, I just took, Again, I took, uh, I want to get this joint tight, okay, so 
<coughs> two by four across here, fasten it like that. I had my block here, I fasten it here. So now this is stable. I have pressure coming in from this way, but as you cut it, this these two pieces won't touch and it'll create that even perfect gap. And then you release these two pins and you can squeeze the whole piece together. Now getting back to uh, putting the, the, the massive size of that horse, I was really concerned of how to keep it together. Um, there's, there's a ton of different, you know, my only prop I brought in those primo uh, invention ever made is a timber lock screw. You can get these at Home Depot, Lowe's, most hardware stores sell them. They replace those lag screws. These suckers are so good for what we use. They're five, five sixteenths head. You can drive them right in and they leave little, little mark and they're super strong. They don't split the wood. So I use, I use these all the time. Uh, let me see, where was it? Before I broke up. Pre -drill. Pre -drill. And you don't have to, that's the beauty of it. You don't have to pre-drill. And certainly, I mean, if you're going real small, pre-drill, but for the most part, so these things, these are great to help keep whole pieces together. Uh, that was it. Good. That's all I got. So, the are so big. Like yeah, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Dan. Okay, so getting back to the horse. Let's see. How do we do it? Okay, so we got this. We got the chest of the... Uh, let me try. We got this horse here like this. You know, uh, coming out. Whatever. Okay. Um, this here... This was a joint, and then I had, you know, the body, then the ass. Okay, so I had this joint and this joint. Um, seeing the beauty, the, the beauty in this grain, my my after I kind of put this all together, I said, well, how am I going to keep this fastened? I couldn't put screws in. As I was building it, I actually, if you look up underneath the horse. There's, there's a ton of little black holes everywhere, and uh, because I was constantly, you know, tagging them in, putting the screws in to hold the wood together as I was going. But what I did was, uh, I was looking at this, and I said, well, how can we compress it together? So, well, all thread, big, long, uh, one-inch all-thread rods, you can run them on both sides, right? So I figured, what I'd do is I'd just drill through the whole thing, and, and bolt them like that. But I didn't want, the chest came out, like I didn't want these big holes in the chest. So what I did was I hollowed this piece out like this. I took a steel plate and I mounted it right here. And then I took the old thread, I, bolt, uh, I put a nut here and a nut here, and I ran that old thread like this. And like this, okay? This steel plate here, th this is on the inside, this piece and this piece, keep in mind, is just a, like a donut. It's hollow all the way through. So I didn't have to worry about drilling like these precision holes through. I removed all the wood. Those things could go anywhere. So I, I put those two pieces on. Then this piece, I put another steel plate here and another steel plate here um, to align these. And then with Precision Eye, with uh, Ken Tyne and Ken Packy, they're sitting there and all right, looks good, you know, <laughs> drilled through, and I actually came out right in the right in the right spot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't want it to come out like, you know. <laughs> so by doing that, these, these rods go all the way through. These pieces are hollow. This I hollowed out as much as I could. And for you new guys, too, we all have that problem with wood crack and wood split. The more you did, I learned this from hand carvers. They always hollow out their pieces if they could. Because less wood, less moisture, less crack. And with a piece like this, that's the last thing I want that to happen. So, and it's easier to move these big blocks once they're hollowed out. So these kind of free float by putting those two steel plates, they, they align, and then by putting, and when these came out, I was able to nut them and start cranking down, which just start cranking this horse down. Now, these gaps, I still didn't get to that fine, I, I stepped ahead of myself as far as getting to that final hands, uh, Hands on. So I still had pretty kind of wide gap, too wide for me to, to call good. Um, I still had some gaps, but now I had no screws touching any part of where I wanted to cut through. All I had was these two rods in the center. So now I crank it down and I just go in there real slow and I just start cutting my seams and I just dissect it. 
and slowly but surely, you know, you got all the gaps off and <coughs> kept cranking. The base here, you know, this was a this was a tree and this was a tree. I had to add this piece, but I left this piece out, put a ratchet strap around this piece to keep, you know, to crank in the base as, and then I, I crank that down. And just by going around and around with that little handsaw eventually, again I didn't have much wood behind it, just barely had enough wood and then as I cut through and tightened down eventually I got I mean it took me quite some time but eventually I got it down. So I carved that in I carved that out in uh, this summer. And so I knew the wood was gonna I knew the wood was gonna shrink a bit and it was like I said, I had no idea what was going to happen. So I brought it into the shop, and it, it sat for the last couple months um, under heat, and to see exactly how much it would shrink. And sure enough, one seam, the, the seam in the center, had opened up just a wee bit, opened up about an eighth of an inch. And I went back about a month ago. I went back and did the same thing, that same process. And I just because it was wider on top, it was touching the top and bottom, but that middle. I just kept going around and going around until eventually the seams meshed and matched. Um, but this, this concept here, the horse was a little bit more difficult because it's such a smooth surface. Now picture you put this concept together and you're doing a big grizzly bear or you're, you're doing a human figure. You'll see like Tommy, Tommy, at, you know, when he first came over, he's like, hey, hey Jeff, uh, can you help me out? I said, he had that little chicken wing. You know, he tried to fit the whole arm. <coughs> Cut it off. Let's add, let's add another piece. You know we can do it, and it's, it's a pretty simple concept. Once you once you understand, uh, you could really expand. And Ben, you've been doing this for years, attaching wings and attaching things. So there's there's so many different options and there's so many different ways. This this class here, I'm just kind of giving you an idea of you know uh, the process that I went through. But uh, you know there's there's tons and tons of different. Um, ideas and concepts coming out. What really inspired me was seeing uh, Chris Fultz this, this summer up in Chetland. I don't know if you guys saw the octopus that this kid did, but it blew us all out of water. He took this eight foot log and made it into this 14 foot octopus and his joinery was just incredible. Now he's an ice carver and they're known for putting and adding blocks. So by seeing that, Seeing him going outside that box and adding these huge tentacles and going all over, it just was like, yeah, our trees are, so what if our trees are getting smaller? Let's get smarter and let's make our pieces, you know, we could go in any, any, any direction. Uh, question. Hey, Thank Jeff, you. When you're, uh, when you're talking about that plate up there in the front on the, uh, on the, uh, the front of the horse. Yeah. How'd you mount that plate? into that horse so you had that strength to pull everything together because those can't all be free floating inside there no they're Nothing's all mount, gonna yeah tighten good, down. good point okay we're looking we're looking from the ass end of the horse but in the in the front here's his neck say and then here's his belly okay we're looking in i hollowed that piece out uh basically i cut a hole in here the steel plate was ran like this okay and then i just fastened it with those timber lock screws i well at I first i was like it right into the thing yeah lagged it and i bolted the heck out of that thing you, you ain't never getting that thing apart but i had this problem i was like well how am i gonna reach my hand behind there and tighten up that bolt and i was sitting there trying to struggle and i kept hauling out deeper trying to i thought oh you idiot hey let's, let's just put the bolt on it like this and we stick it up, and then I screwed it in. So that's that was one. Yeah. But uh, it took me about an hour. I was trying to reach Would my you hand. Weld the nuts right on the. No, I, I I took uh I, I took two two nuts. You got this. Okay, I know on either side. Yeah, here. Lock it. Yeah. Lock washer, here. All right, lock washer on both sides. Okay. And I cranked it down. So I had this plate. The bolt was here, and these ran off this way. But again, I was sitting there trying to carve out a handhold so I yeah. can and I was like, well I can't get a wrench in there. Yeah. It's amazing on how oh, yeah. like you're sitting there and all of a sudden I was like, well wait a minute, let me just take that off, put this thing together, and then screw it on. And so that's that's what that's how I ended up. So this thing is locked in there. It's bolted to the face of this and then each one of these ran out this way. So no matter how that's hard I crank. Wondering how you anchored that. 
so that you can have that force to draw everything together. Yeah, I anchored it here and here, and I put like four big pins. So you just like relief that plate back inside there. Exactly. So that when you put it together, that plate's not touching the plate's anything. sitting flush. That, yeah, <laughs> well, it's actually recessed in a little bit right. because I didn't want the second piece having any anything to do with it. Uh, so I just recessed that plate in there and then anchored the heck out of it like that. And I did the same thing. Now, the other thing was, because we were kind of just working, uh, things weren't aligning right. And when, by the time we got to the, by the time we, we put, you know, we put this piece on, we put this piece on, by the time we got to this piece, that, that um, the horse was starting to shift. Like each block was getting offset. And we had a little bit to work with. And I only had a little bit to work with. So we were trying to like bend and prime us. I don't want that tension in that, that rod. I, I want to keep it floating. So we just came up with some concepts, just moved the screws a little bit over to the left or a little bit over to the right, and each piece, um, then, it, then it finally <laughs> lined up. Because I would put the plate on and try to stick this piece on, but then I was like a half inch over. So I just unscrewed the plate, shifted the plate over on the inside. And same with the, the middle two pieces were a little bit more difficult, but I had left my I had left myself enough room to put a plate like this, okay? And then once I got all that... Um, so those plates are anchored on your on your belly pieces? On uh, my belly pieces. And the, what that allowed us to do, because the, the, at first I didn't put those two plates in the middle. And I had Ken and Ken trying to hold this thing, and this thing is, you know, floating. Okay, yeah, you got it, you know. And it was just too, by making these two plates and cutting these two holes out right here, it was a one inch, one inch hole, or uh, one inch all thread, so I did like an inch and a quarter, believe me, a little, a little jiggle room. But then, um, like when this, as, as I put on the next piece, like it was a little off. You know, the next piece was say like that. So I just shifted this over to align both those holes and then everything lined back up within a, within a quarter inch. But I left myself enough so if any little shift, then I could just sand off and, and smooth out. Did you uh, bolt each piece in individually? Like, you, you know, know, on this horse, I didn't. At this horse, I said, well, no, I want everything to free float because I didn't know how it was going to... I've done a second one um, on a smaller scale, same concept, but I was like, yeah, why not? Why not just... Yeah, and then put a bolt in. So, like, yeah, on this piece, I did it. But on the second piece, I said, yeah, just now, that was, that's a very good question because I was sitting there and I was like... Well, why didn't I do that the first time? Why was I so, we had all these jigs and everything trying to hold all these blocks to self-line. Well, idiot, just put a bolt on and that would hold the second piece on. Put a bolt on, that would hold the third piece on and then the fourth piece. So that, that's what I, yeah. How did you, um, yeah, before you started folding them together, you, you had the, the shape down. How did you have them in place to carve them the way you wanted them? By putting, going back to before, um, with, uh, yeah, going back to before, I had these, you know, I had these four blocks in there like this. These two blocks being the, uh, right? Remember, I told you I built a, uh, I built a, a thing that went right through the center, all the way out, and I kept this the whole time I built it. So what that allowed me to do is all these. This goes right through the horse's legs, uh, and right out through the front. This is. I left that beam right across, so I had a place to keep setting, and that was the, the belly, the underbelly of it. So this piece and this piece always set in the same line and never moved. Jigs are, I, I mean, just I kind of left a little on the bottom to keep it. Yeah, and I just use little shims because where it bellied up, I just use the little shims to self line. But by keeping a by keeping a, a steady point at all times. Uh, you always have, you have something to go back to. I built this wider than the base and outside, so I was able to pull the pieces on and off, but always keep a constant, yeah. uh, you so, know, keep a constant reference. So, and, and then at the, uh, at the back end, then would you just have like a, like a couple holes go through and put the plugs in? Yeah, what I, what I did was, uh, I took the Forstner bit, because I knew I had a plug eventually. Yeah. And this, just to give you an idea, when I first, when I first nutted those rods on, when I, I could barely, you know, I cut the all thread back just yeah. enough to just feed it. Yeah, yeah. Um, over six months' time, I gained almost two inches 
of Alter it just by sucking you know, that stuff in tight. But what I did was in the, uh, now, uh, don't get the wrong impression here, but here's, here's the ass end of the horse. So here's his, the center. Those holes popped out. When those holes popped out, right then and there, I took a, a two-inch Forstner bit, mm -hmm. and, you know, you have that one-inch hole here. I made a hole like that, and I made a hole like that, knowing that I could plug it in the end. That, that, that hole was there so you get the, the wash of the nut yeah. and all that on, suck it in. And then my final tightening, when I finally tightened it, um, I cut two plugs and, and just popped yeah. in the plugs. Those so plugs are, are glued in, and it, I could always just drill them out yeah. real quick if I needed to tighten yeah, them Yeah, but if, if you ever get the jacket, can be adjusted. Yeah, yeah, I just, I just used a little wood glue on that, a little wood glue and sawdust, because it was actually really hard. And if you look, I was so disappointed with these plugs, because you can see that little glue line all the way around. But next time I'll build a jig, and that will be. <laughs> Other than having those the, the glue plugs in the chest, how do you think it would have worked if you had got the drill or welded together and drilled it long enough to just drill through the entire thing and, and have thread off from one end to the other? Um, well, I guess that would I guess that would work too. Um, I didn't have to drill. Well, the only thing I had to drill was these two holes right out the back end because everything else was hollow. Okay. All the way through, so I didn't right, have to. You weren't going, you weren't really going through the wood; you were just going through the plates. You know, the because that was my first. That was my first theory. I was like, "Well, I'll figure out. You know, I'll make. I'll get. I'll go and buy like five attachments, and I'll sit there. And, you know, I'll just keep adding attachments and going further and further. But by hollowing all that out, I never even had to do that because I didn't have to. See that. There was no two direct holes that had to follow through. I made those those two direct holes with the steel plate. Mm -hmm. So there's. Yeah, I had plenty of freedom to go whichever way I wanted to go. I didn't um, ever, the only two were these two, and that was the hardest two because those, by the time you pulled the piece off, you have this threaded rod, then you had to pull the piece off like that, and I had to drill this way still. Oh, yeah, and then the slide, the, yeah, from the inside, because if I tried drilling that way, you know, coming from the ass end, up. it would have never matched up. So we just put that piece there, and we slid the piece out, and Ken and Ken just kept there, and I was like, good. He's like, go for it, dude, go for it. You know? And what I actually ended up doing, I piloted a hole at a quarter inch. So if I was a little off, you know, once it came out right in that crease, then I went and reboarded. But I, I piloted a hole with a quarter inch bit first. And so this way, if it was a little bit off on the, you know, I could back it off. Because, you know, all those bits go, they go, and then they have that little feeder. Yeah. You know, that one little. And so you could just actually feel the wood. If you ever have to pre-drill, like um, through legs, through thin legs of these horses, I I, pre, I, 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 I drill down through with a small and I add a, a steel rod through them, you know, give them a little strength if they do crack. Yeah, um, yeah, there's one right, you can see the plug, there's one that goes right up into the chest. Well, that was actually the very, that was the very first day I, I, I was blocked that, that arm out, and then when I cut that big block out underneath it, that block fell and knocked that, that that arm off right away. So I put that in there, but then I pre-drilled and I put a long. I put, actually, I used a timber lock on that, a good 14-inch timber lock, and it goes right up and almost right through the elbow. But, um, go ahead, Scott. What would you say are your concerns with the variable drying rates between the stuff that's hollowed out and the pieces that have a um, greater core elements of the wood? Um, two years out, a year and a half, two years out, I mean, you're experiencing a lot of this. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, basically, uh, epoxy fix all wounds. <laughs> I mean, anything, and that's, that's the other thing. With, with wood, um, you know, uh, with wood, just there, there's so many different uh, ways of, of filling and fairing in, and gaps and creases. With this piece here, obviously, I'm going to keep an eye on it. Um, it is going in the ladies' living room. Um, so it'll be at a hotter temperature uh, during the winters. We'll see what happens, but a, you know, epoxy will fit all. By hollowing out most of it, 90% of, of the wood, it lightened it. The moisture content, I find, is pretty, pretty low, but there's still room for, uh, you know, there's still room for cracking. But this is a new adventure for me, so we're going we're gonna to see how it goes. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Go ahead. Did you save a piece of that wood 
the old cracks in case they eventually open up. You know, I thought about it, but Jack, as you know, there's plenty more of that same nice view. Yeah. That, that would, um, I don't think, would matter. You know, I've used other pieces from other logs to put. I used to save any time I do a carving, I always, I always cut do. one slab off that I could make shims and wedges with. Uh, but over time, I find that you could pretty much blend it in pretty close as long as it's the like same species as it and the same kind of age, you know, as far as cut. You don't want to put a, a fresh wedge in something that's been sitting for a long time or vice versa. Uh, Dave, you have a question? I was say, next time you have to drill like that, one of those little inexpensive laser level lights would work really good on a regular shape <coughs> where that thing's going to come out. Yeah. If you don't have the extra help. Right. Or... Yeah, laser. We, 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 I know what you're saying. I showed one the other day here where I use it for cutting into a log a certain level so you get in the right spot all around. I've, act, that remind, I've actually used that concept. Um, I have a picture of that totem pole I did years ago where I had to get this 18 foot log and I had to, I tried to, you know, I had to cut up. A, 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 it went up against between two garage doors and it went right up 18 feet. And I had car, it was three quarters of the way around, and I had to cut that, that last thing, and the log had a little bit of tilt to it, a little lead. So I said, well, how am I gonna, you know, I try to drop a plumb down, line down, but if you're cutting like half a log, that doesn't really work. So I waited till that night, I took that, the same laser level, I put it up, and in the dark, I just sat there and chased that line up, and then, then cut it off. But that laser is, is a good tool. This, I didn't have a laser, and I actually never even, Considered that I just use my eyes and my hands. I think uh, an old carver told me one time. He says your best your best tools and your best calipers are right here. Your eyes and your hands. And you know if, if you're going over and you, and you can't you can't figure out what's right on your carving or what's wrong. There's something blowing you. You know just something that didn't come out right. But there's something that's just not right. Close your eyes and just feel. You know with your thumbs and your and your hands and you, you really could get. All of a sudden, there'd be something that pokes out on one side that doesn't on the other. And you open your eyes, and that's that thing that you probably thought was bothering you the whole time. But your eyes and your hands are really a, a good tool to uh, for accuracy. Uh, does someone else have any questions? How thick were the plates? Uh, they were uh, three, four, maybe quarter inch, quarter inch plates. Yeah, eighth, no, about eighth inch. I don't know, whatever. But they're they're big concrete plates that they use to fasten concrete to buildings. I got them right at Home Depot. Not the thin, not those real thin like uh, tie strap stuff, but it, yeah, three sixteen something like that. A, good, a decent enough plate where I wasn't, you know, I'm not I'm not holding a car part together. I'm just, you know, it's, it is good and it is it's all separate. Well, one one other thing I wanted to go over. This is another little cool jig that I made just last time, um, when, when I actually built this horse, okay, again, I was shooting off the hip, and I had no real game plan. And nobody really knows this, so I'm gonna reveal this. This, this piece, this front of this horse piece was a little shorter. It was about three inches shorter. So when we were building it off this box, I added a three, three and a half, three and a half inch block underneath this to make the same, you know, to make this all level. And then I filled in all these pieces. So when I, uh, just in the last month, I actually, I knew I had a, I had, it was ready to uh, reshift. I never really finished the base. I had carved it, the picture that you guys probably saw that Ken posted out in Sturgis. That base was just a, kind of a hodgepodge of different pieces because I just kind of winged it and put it all together. But knowing that that uh, my client wanted this piece and I really had to finish it up. This thing was the biggest stressor that I had was, okay, when I take all this apart, I knew how I wanted to do it. I, I wanted to make a nice big frame box for it. Then I wanted to put a slab down and I wanted to sit this horse right on. But knowing that when I first started, this was off by three and a half inches and this was lower. This was actually sitting on the main box. This was sat, sitting on a slab but I wanted to get them all to this height. Again, going back to my box here, it was the only point I had. I, I thought about you know, taking my saw and trying to eye it up and cut it up underneath, and I said that would never work to make 
this one continuous line. I had a simple idea. This box here is my only true point. I built another jig, this is in my shop, built another jig that held this, suspended this horse up. Big beam going up underneath and then bracing. So that, so I was able, what I was able to do is once I had all that bracing, this horse was actually suspended in the air. Um, I was able to take this block out and all these blocks, this still sat there. I took the difference between my saw, my, the top of my saw blade and, uh, uh, yeah, I, what I did was I basically, you know, uh, I, I took a block, and I cut a block like this, put my saw, it, we don't have a bar here, well, you got a bar like this, you know, here's your chainsaw bar. Drill the hole there, drill the hole there. Put, this is the top, put a block like this, and a block like that, which was this difference. Being here, I, I just laid the, I laid the bar on that box, the horse is up here, I had my two blocks like that, and I just actually ran my saw this way, keep it down with pressure. We had a, uh, had an old uh, Alaskan sawmill that, got ran over and I saved all the parts but I took the end piece the one that goes around the sprocket and I, I bolted on there and, and Ken Tynan held that piece and we just went like this and cut this perfect line just like that took this piece out removed this box put a new box in and it sucked it up tight and boy was that a good feeling that was <laughs> but uh I mean, there's there's a lot of different ways you can join stuff. There's Gorilla Glue. I'm sure everybody's heard of it. It's probably the best stuff as far as putting pieces together, um, you know, in, in our industry because of the moisture content. It really works well. There's there's a bunch of different, well, there's only one epoxy that I ever use. It's called West System Epoxy. You get it through uh, West Marine, and you find it online. Uh, most woodworking that. magazines will show ads for West System. It's a two-part hardener. Go ahead. Lee Valley thing has got West System and all the biofilms and everything that goes with that. Yeah. Bio. Now the thing with that, I, um, I, uh, the shop that I'm now renting is uh, out of a, a boat builder shop. And we talk all the time about this West System. It's the best stuff. He's into fiberglass boat building. They buy all those fillers. When I first started, I spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars on all these different fillers. Save yourself some time, save the sawdust that comes out of your orbital sander, and just use that. You can mix that, the sawdust with the two part, and you can blend, um, you can make it any consistency, and it has enough teeth, teeth meaning bite, you know, the, the different grit sawdust that you use. If you want a, you want a stronger bond, you use a little bit, like a 150 grit sawdust. If you want a more of a fairing, like the fill, use like a 220, a more finer dust. But that stuff, I've been using it from um, from the first time I started. I have pieces that are now 10, 15, or 10, 13, over 10 years old, and that, that epoxy is still held. That epoxy will last longer than the wood itself. Um, but that's great to use uh, to, to join pieces for structure. It's also great to fill cracks. Uh, my, uh, my, bro my brother Dave, he's actually here. He's he mastered um, filling in cracks. He would, he'd come up to my shop and just spend nights, and he would build all these little out of duct tape. You know, you have you, you have your you have your crack and your bear, right? So you lay your bear down. You you mix up this epoxy. Well, you make it too thick, you can't shove it all down. You want to kind of get that epoxy down to the center of that tree. So we do a couple little light pours, you know. And what that will always do, you know, you got your bear like this. Well, that will run out. You know, if you pour it too thin. So what he would do is, the first thing you do, if you're going to fix a crack, sand down that fur right over that crack, wherever it is. Take your take your angle grinder and just smooth it out so you have a nice smooth surface so you don't ruin those little rubber gloves when you try to go like that. And you're always catching it on all the little fur. Smooth it out. And then what he would do is he'd just take duct tape and build these little dams. And eventually, you know, you duct tape over and duct tape over just to one point, the highest point. And then you just pour it in there, and eventually, you know, that it would kind of spew out a little bit here and there. But you pull off that duct tape, and now you've got a real clean uh, surface, and you've got that epoxy that goes all the way down to the center of the, to the 
to the pit of the tree. I find playing cards helps in that too. You clean up playing cards. Playing cards. Uh huh. And yeah. clean out that sucker real good before you do yeah. it too. Yeah, blow it out, clean it out. And if you have another trick too, is you have those cracks that kind of, you know, go like that, or they taper, if they're wider. Take your take your chainsaw, plunge it right into that crack, make one clean line. It's also good you can you can fill it with you can fill it with epoxy or you can fill it with shims. Either way, if you make that one clean line, you know, if you have a crack that's like this, you know, and goes like that, you know, and maybe wider in some areas, well, take your chainsaw and make that one curve, boom, right in the center. And now you can cut shims all the same width, and when you taper them in, you don't have these different, you know, these different boards. You can, you can actually make that nice clean cut with your saw and then fill it in that way. But that's... Uh, uh, that's that's fun. Is there anybody else have any questions? I don't know if that helped or hurt or anything like that, but you know, basically, just get out there, try it. You know, I I've never had any kind of teaching or any any background. I just try to figure things out on my own. I um, a lot of these things that it's taken me 13 years to do. I can show someone in 10 minutes, and they're you know. But I, I we're all here to uh, to learn off each other. And everybody's got something new to the table. Everybody's got some kind of trick. You know, this, when I first came here, it felt like there was always like, you know, keep it secret. Keep, oh, don't tell this guy how to do it. He'll do it better. But who cares? Let him do it. I want to see him do it better. Rich Hamilton came with me and kept tying on the road. And I don't know if anybody guys seen Rich's piece out there, but from what he was carving two years ago to what he's carving now is absolutely mind-blowing. Harley, um, you know, just, just people around. Yeah, Jim Madsen over there. <laughs> okay, I've got a question, sure. and, and, and I've been thinking about it for a while, and I, I've, I've never tried it, but uh, with, with wood cracking there now, I don't know if anybody else has, has, has done it, is how about if you took like a, like, like a long drill bit, like say, say on a bear, you know, and, when, when it cracks, is just drill right from the top of the head or from the bottom up, drill it straight down and fill it up with, with a type of a mineral oil or, or a uh, canola oil or anything like that and just put a plug in and let it go because it's moisture trying to get out and if it soaks in the oil, would that not stop cracking? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in that field. I've actually done it. I've tried that. I've uh, built big bats and soaked the bottom and mm -hmm. in, the, in the same kind of thing to soak it up, to soak like a sponge. Um, you know, I... I'm no expert on that. I would, I would say the, the more things we try to, uh, mm -hmm. the, the more different ways we try it, you know. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that'll work. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try it. I haven't tried it yet, but, yeah. but, but, but I'm, I'm going to try it. And, and uh, to, 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 to me, yeah, if, if, uh, my, my theory is there is, is if you replace moisture with oil, and the oil lasts uh, lasts a lot longer, and 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 in a few years or something like that, if it dries out, you uh, drill out the plug and uh, and uh, and uh, refill it up with oil again. Yeah, it it's, makes sense. They do make a product. Go ahead, Dave. A question: uh, When you're using those uh, bolts, to keep something in. You got the drill glue. Do you have a trick uh, for coating that bolt so it doesn't get? I was going through the grill glue and grill glue locks that sucker. And say you don't want, you want to be able to take it out. Is there anything you ever put on them to keep the grill glue from adhering to that bolt so you can unscrew it? Well, I I did try uh, putting oil on it, but what I find is that just once you threaded it in and thread it out. Basically, what I do is when I when I wanted something to suck in with with grill glue, I try to. Uh, I haven't really mastered that one yet. I haven't figured out. Do you, have you? No. That out? Well, we tried something. I think we put some canola oil on a bolt, but because I've had that happen before, where I screwed it in, and then you it can't get it out. Holding it, you couldn't put a strap around it. Right. I wanted to hold it so it dried, but then Gorilla Glue got on it, and that sucker's locked in there. So you end up with a grinder. Right. Saying it up. Yeah, you that's happened to me too. I know what you're saying. I think the best thing is just trying to get that. The screw heads not to pick up the least amount of grill glue possible. Um, I've, I've come across that. I know what you're talking about, but no, I haven't figured that one out yet. But if anyone does, let us know. It'll save us a lot of extra time. Um, go ahead, Peter. Hi, Jeff. Just <coughs> when you were working through the project in your mind before you actually started, how long did you think the project would take you? Um, and then 
when you completed the project, how, how did that compare to your original thoughts? Well, I, again, like my my biggest, I, I kind of my my philosophy in life is really not have a plan because that plan always constantly changes. Just go with it and adapt. I have no. When I start off with this, it was just like one little piece of a puzzle to the next. I never set a time, a date. I didn't really care. Um, and I can't add up the hours that I would sit there after I'm done and sitting there looking at night and just walking around it and figuring things out. I spend a lot of time um, afterwards. And like, I don't know if everybody worked on something for so long, you're sitting there and you close your eyes and then you just see those images just popping. I have a hard time shutting off my brain, so I can't really put it all together. The whole the whole project I got it done uh, in five weeks. The first first phase, get it all finished, put a sealer on it. Base wasn't completely done, but the horse was done. We brought that piece out to Sturges uh, for the bike rally, and then we brought it back to Washington. And just a month and a half ago, if you look at the signature, it actually says just a couple weeks ago. Actually, it was two day and a half before I got here. I worked like probably 90 something hours straight, really with like an hour or two of sleep in between sanding this thing because I had a reef. Yeah, that was, that's a, another whole story. When I put all this, when I put the penetrating, I put a penetrating oil on it to get it sealed to, to show, um, knowing that I had to come back and redo it. That one gap in the middle, I had a re, I had a recut and I tried to fair it out. Didn't work had a ring, you know, because it was sun beaten on these two halves. And then when I sanded that down, that, that horse got so light. So I basically, I went to Home Depot, Lowe's, and Ace, and I bought out every hook and loop sandpaper they own um, from 40 grit up to 150 grit. And I, I had to re-sand the entire horse down. Um, I had to get off every speck of, of varnish on that, or of, of log oil on that. So I think it took me longer. Uh, I constructed it. It took me almost as long to re. Well, it took me a couple weeks to sand it. It took me like four weeks to refinish it. So hours of time. But it's not about. I don't. I don't never put a price tag on like, like hours and time. I come by the finished piece. You know, everybody comes up and says, "Oh, well, how much you get per hour and all that." You know, uh, a great quote. I don't know who said it, um, but artists don't get paid for their time. They get paid for their their vision, I guess, and make something like that. And it's really true. I mean, you could nail a piece in an hour and sell it for a great deal of money, or you could spend a week on a piece, not come up with anything. So how do you come up with that, you know? Um, I just say, carve from the heart, carve as best as you possibly can, take it as far as you possibly can, try to come up with an end game, finish it to a level of completion where you're happy with it, the client's happy with it. But most of all, just, yeah, just carve for yourself. And, and the pieces will, you know, it will come out. Um, the beauty of the natural capture will come out. And when you look at it. Yes? How do you all finish your carving? How do you finish your carving? Do you get the cracks? Um, well, you know, the, 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 there's no rocket science uh, to uh, art. I, I don't really know. I, I've tried many different finishes, basically. Keep them out of the sun, low heat, and uh, finish them with a good, during the winters, I tend to use a varnish because it dries a little quicker. During the summers, I tend to use a, a, a penetrating oil. Cabot makes a good uh, Australian timber oil. Uh, Ace Hardware makes a log oil that's really good. Penetrating oils during the summer, you get a lot more heat. Uh, especially, you don't want to varnish them in the sun, but if you bring them out, it really sucks it into the grain. Yeah. During the during the winters, when the wood everything's a lot colder and denser, uh, it's it's. I, I use more of a varnish. Oh, yeah. Anything else? No. One more. I have some questions that are, don't relate to joinery. Uh. uh he wants you to talk about fur and faces of your animals. Okay, uh, tell him to come back next year. <laughs> <laughs> you heard that answer. Okay. And. Good answer. 
<laughs> I think we're all itching. Or again. maybe you're burning and texturing. Yeah, what, uh, yeah. What are the biggest mistakes that he sees people making when they're working on bears? Uh, that's 2003. Yeah. What, that's would, what would you like to improve on? Myself, I'd just like to keep, uh, yeah, I'd like to improve on every piece I do. You know, learn, uh, you, know, you only learn by making mistakes, and my biggest mistakes have turned out to be my best learning tools. So, uh, and what brand of varnish do you prefer? Uh, free ones, usually. Like, like promoters give us free varnish. No, uh, there's all different. Every product makes a, you know, every company makes a good product. I'm not a spokesperson for that, so I, I like what's up. I'll, I'll answer. Cabots. Yeah, there we go. Cabots. Hey, Jeff. Preferred yeah. wood. Yeah, talk about learning about your mistakes. I have made so many mistakes, there's no doubt in my mind I am a genius. Yes. <laughs> well said. And on that, we're out. Let's go cars. Thank you. Okay.